But, but if you poke and you prod people enough, asking them questions, um, rather than prodding and poking them with instruments, you ask them questions, you'll find that more than likely most people have an ideal life planned out for themselves or had an ideal life that was planned out for them. For some, it is the standardized life of settling down, getting married, raising a family, finding a job that they love and seeing out their days until retirement. At this point, their life will either be dominated by trips to sunnier climates or dedicated to the dictated rather to them by their grandchildren. But retirement will ideally, in an ideal world, be sweet either way. For others, well, for others, the plan is to accumulate as much money as possible and as quickly as possible to take that retirement a little bit earlier than everybody else and used all the spare time that they now have wondering why they came out of work in the first place because they realize that they're now busier than they were whenever they were working 40 hours a week. You see... They retired early so they could spend time with the people that they enjoy spending company with. And it turns out that that's about five people. But those other five people, that they have lives as well and they're really busy so they don't see as much of them as they would like. And now they're going, just get me back to work for goodness sake. I have had enough. But I think regardless of what the ideal life is or what, how life has panned out, If we all sat for long enough, we would be able to come up with what our ideal life would look like. And the truth is that for each person in the room here this morning, or even those who will watch this online later, that two stories are unlikely to be the same. Even if you're married to another individual, your ideal life would include them, hopefully, but it may be a little bit different. There were a couple in the Old Testament called Abraham and Sarai and they had plans just like the rest of us. They find themselves living in the city of Haran in the region of Padan Aram, which is a nice word to say, Padan Aram. Everybody just turn to the person beside you and say Padan Aram, right? Padan Aram. Did you think you were going to say that this morning, right? Padan Aram. Abram is in his mid-70s at this stage and Sarai is a slightly younger bride in her early 70s. And they are called by God to get up, to take their possessions and their family and move to another land. We read about it in Genesis 12. It says, The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And on all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's pretty cool, but it wasn't part of the plan. It wasn't part of the plan. There's no way that Abram, whenever he sat down and was chatting life through with Sarai, had relocate to another land and take everyone and everything with me on his list of things to do. Least of all, in his 70s, at the age of 75, it just would... Could you imagine? Could you imagine at the age of 75 just being told... See, everything you know, I want you to leave it and go somewhere. You have no idea where I'm going to take you. It wasn't quite on the to-do list. But at least he's got the promise of God to hold on to, right? Well, about that. You see, things had not necessarily gone to plan for Abram and Sarai. For whatever reason and through no fault of their own, Their desire for a child of their own had not been realized. So as God promises to make Abram into a great nation, 
and later in Genesis 17 promises to make him the father of nations, there's only one small problem. There's actually a really big problem. You see, for the line to continue, there, there has to be a child. And Abram and Sarai didn't have one of those. And well, I'm not really an expert in all things pre and antenatal. My mother-in-law is, and we have Elizabeth, who is a midwife as well, an expert in the field. But I'm no expert. But one thing I do know is that there's a specific time period in a lady's life in which this can actually happen. And it's a relatively short window in the grand scheme of things. And well, Sarah, she's well into her 70s now. So yeah, surely that's not going to happen. It's basic biology after all, isn't it? Yet, we're told that this couple in their 70s go with God and follow his commands. As was stated, as Jack read to us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, it tells us that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. The control freak in me hates that. (laughs) Where, where, Where are we going? I'll go with you, but let me know where you're going. I used to hate playing games in youth group where they blindfolded you. And they had to lead you through a room and it was a trust exercise. And I realized I don't really trust people at all. And I think it all stems from the fact that, do you remember those trust falls that you used to do? And you fall back into somebody's arms. My youth leader moved out of the way and I hit the floor, right? I'm not going to name him, but it was Stephen McAllister. And, And it was awful, right? But even though he didn't know where he was going, we're told that Abraham obeyed God and went. Anyway, sometimes, just sometimes, God will ask us to do things that don't make sense to us, okay? We've seen it last week whenever we looked at the life of Noah, yet Noah, in hindsight, will be very glad that he obeyed God and built the ark, for the floodwaters did indeed come, and he and his family were safe inside, And just as we've seen it last week with Noah, today as we dive a little deeper into the story of Abram and Sarai, we'll once again see that just because what what God's asking us to do might seem impossible and not make much sense to us at all, that God continually chooses to write his story with the ink of our obedience. Now the story of Abram and Sarai is a long one and a vast one and we're not going to be able to cover all of it in a short time that we have together this morning and you'll be glad to know that we're not going to try and cover all of it as well. But some highlights before we move to focus on the events which will form the rest of the message for us this morning. God makes four four separate yet connected promises to Abram over his lifetime. God promises him land. He promises him numerous descendants. He promises him blessing for him and said descendants. And he also promises blessing would come to him uh, and through him for all nations. Okay, so four promises. And as far as promises go, those are four pretty good promises. That if God himself is saying, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you descendants, I'm going to bless you and your descendants, and all who follow will be blessed in every nation through you. Those are pretty good promises. But Abram's getting older. Sarai is well past childbearing age, and there's no direct offspring from their marriage. Being barren or unable to produce offspring was also considered to be a curse in those days and it brought shame to the family and shame to the family name. It was a place of scorn and it was a place of shame and it was a predicament in which someone who was in communion with God in the way that Abram was should never have been experiencing in the minds of the people. You see, Sarai, Abram's wife, 
believing herself to be the problem, although it was not her fault at all, and it was the result of a fallen world in which we live today as well and experience ourselves. Although not her fault, she blamed herself. So she came to Abram knowing that the promise had been made and she came to him with a proposal. A proposal not of adoption or of fostering or of surrogacy or any of the other options that are around about in our modern day. But with the proposal that Abram go outside of the marital relationship and has a child with one of Sarai's servants. An Egyptian by the name of Hagar. And I want to tell you that that story goes exactly as you imagine it would go. Because that doesn't make for complicated family life at all, right? It, 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 it goes exactly as you imagine it would. It is a complete and utter mess. Abram goes and he takes Sarai's proposal seriously and he makes sure that ha- that happens. And you think, perhaps I'm making it all up. It's always good to check that I'm not, right? So you can read all about that in Genesis chapter 16. And we're, where we're told that Hagar gives birth to Ishmael whilst Abram is the ripe old age of 86 years old, the very thought of which makes me cry inside. I'm only 30 and I've got panda eyes. I couldn't imagine raising children aged 86 and beyond. It would break my heart, you know? The thing about grandchildren is I'm told that they're great, but you can give them back (laughs) and you can go to bed and you can sleep. But he's 86, and he's a dad for the first time. But what we have here with this proposal and what ends up being an outworking of all of that, what we, what we see here is a man-made solution to something which God has already promised. It's a man-made solution to something that God has already promised. We don't have time this morning to dive into the realities and the negative implications that this decision would have for the generations which would follow. And in a few weeks, whenever we look at the story of Joseph, you might notice mention of the Ishmaelites as part of that story. But the point, however, is this, that God had made a promise to Abram. And instead of letting it play out Abram and Sarai took matters into their own hands. You see, Abram and Sarai, like you and I, sometimes were unable to see the bigger picture. They couldn't see what God could see and how God had and would be at work from the beginning of creation They couldn't see that God had already begun to write the story that would change everything forever. They couldn't see how they would fit in to that story. So instead of waiting for it all to play out, they did what most of us do, if we're entirely honest. Instead of waiting for it all to play out, they poked and they prodded. And whenever things weren't moving at the pace that they felt that it should be moving at, and when they couldn't see how God could possibly fulfill his promise to them, they decided they would fulfill it for him. And they took matters into their own hands. And that begs a question for each one of us this morning. How often are we guilty of manufacturing man-made solutions to the promises of God. If we believe God to be everything that he says he is, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere, all of the time, author and finisher of our faith, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, the great I am, to name but a few, for whom nothing is too hard nor too difficult. If we believe that God is all of these things and so much more, why on earth do we fall into the trap time and time and time and time and time again of trying to force his hand of trying to speed things up trying to speed up that which he has already promised of insisting that we know better 
than he does. Sure, we're good Christian people and we'd never actually say that we believe that we know better than he does, but the old adage is that actions speak louder than words, don't they? Right? Because let's be honest, I'm not hitting you over the head this morning. That's not what I'm here to do because if we're all honest, we've all done it at some stage and that includes me too. But this morning, could it be that God is saying to us as his people once again, trust me trust me sometimes churches don't need big strategies sometimes churches just need to follow before the Lord in prayer sometimes churches don't need to poke and to prod they just need to be faithful to what God has already asked them to do sometimes just sometimes all of the time We just need to fall at his feet and trust him. We read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart that no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Second Peter 3, 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance as I look back on some of the promises that God has made me in my life and have seen them come to fruition I thank God that they didn't happen when I wanted them to because my life would be entirely different my life would be a mess but God makes everything beautiful in its time For Lord of the Rings fans, there's a wee line right at the start of the Fellowship of the Ring when Gandalf the wizard arrives in the Shire. He's expected to show up and Frodo, one of the wee hobbits, which is one of the characters with small hairy feet, Frodo runs up to him and says, Gandalf, you're late. And Gandalf says to him, and me is doing it, a wizard is never late nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Our God's not a wizard in the sky, but the principle's the same. The promises of God may not be answered when we demand that they be answered or when we wish that they be answered, but he arrives every time on time, precisely when he means to. Precisely when he means to. And in his patience, he doesn't give us it when we we want it, but rather when we need it the most. I wonder if we're getting it. I wonder if I'm getting it. God God had made a promise to Abram and to Sarai, and instead of trusting him for the solution and the outworking of it, they got bored of waiting and they concocted a solution which would have negative implications for them and their family for the rest of their lives. It wasn't that God didn't hold up his end of the bargain because he would and he did, but unnecessary pain and stress was caused by attempting to speed up the process and circumvent the outcome to suit their perception of what the reality should be. And maybe we need to be reminded again and again and again that God has never made a promise that he cannot and will not keep. And maybe, as a former pastor of this church, the Reverend Ivan Miles said to me one day when I was having a chat with him, he says, maybe... Maybe we need to stop being so arrogant that we think that we're going to be the first ones he ever lets down. 
Maybe we need to stop being so arrogant that we think that the creator of all things, the God who is just, the God who is never changing, is going to change and he's going to let us down. See, we might be the apple of his eye, but he's not going to break character and compromise who he is in order to have a laugh at our expense. That's not who he is. It's not who he will ever be. So let's stop with the man-made solutions to heavenly promises. And rather, let's choose to trust and obey his promises and commands. For he knows what's best for us and when is best for us. And all of his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. He alone is the all-knowing, all-powerful God, and we are not. And perhaps it's about time we started living like it. I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 17 because here we see God's redemption and request at work. It'll also appear on the screen behind me, verses 1 to 8. It says, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. Then we jump to verse 15. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to her, said to, Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. And as the promise is made, And God makes it clear that whilst well in their 90s, that offspring, a son would be born to them. We are told also later on that Sarah laughs at the news too. And truth be told, if you're in your 90s and you're being told that you're going to have a baby, you're going to laugh too, right? (laughs) Complete and utter disbelief. Yet when Abraham was 100, it came to pass just as God had said that it would See, the deepest desires of Abraham and Sarah had become reality because of the intervention of the loving, living God in their lives. Isaac, their son, was born to them and the promises of God were proven once again to be trustworthy. You can imagine the joy and the delight on this old couple's face and in their hearts as they held and raised the child that they had longed for, so longed for. 
So you can imagine the surprise sometime later whenever God tests Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moria. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Sorry, what? Say that again. Reread it just to make sure that that's definitely what it says. Pastor, I think you must have misread that. Abraham and Sarah have been longing for Isaac for longer than they could probably even remember. So why on earth would God make such a request? Why on earth would he give the barren woman in her 90s a child only to take him away from her? This is heart-wrenching. It's unthinkable stuff. Yet, it is a very real reality in their lives. You see, Abraham is in a bit of a pickle, to put it lightly. On the one hand, he knows that he and Sarah only have Isaac because of the provision of a loving, faithful God who has kept his promises to them time and time again. Yet, on the other hand, Isaac is everything that both he and Sarah have ever wanted so you can imagine the reluctance can't you you can imagine the rationalization that's happening here in abraham's head in the background i mean if i can rationalize that the leftover pasta in my bowl should be eaten as seconds rather than left for lunch the next day as it was originally intended i'm pretty sure that i could rationalize that i was hearing things whenever God came and told me that I needed to sacrifice my son. The rationalization and the temptation to do that would have been overwhelming. And sure, why on earth tell Sarah about it in the first place? We would only upset her. Why would a loving God give us everything we ever wanted only to take it away? Surely I'm hearing things. Surely. Surely. There's no avoiding here that Abraham is stuck between a rock and a hard place. He would have known what he wanted to do, but he also would have known deep down what he needed to do. And they were two very, very different things. See, he'd already offered a man-made solution to a heavenly promise before, and that had not gone at all as he had hoped In fact, he was still dealing with the aftermath of it decades later. But this time, this time would be different. This time, Abraham had firsthand tried and tested experience of the faithfulness of God. And so he trusted him for the outcome, even when it looked impossible and did not make any sense whatsoever. I really want to encourage you whenever you go home later on or in your quiet time tomorrow morning, whatever, read the rest of Genesis chapter 22. Because as Abraham obeyed God and took Isaac up the mountain, God provided a solution. God provided a substitute, a ram from the thicket that as Isaac lay on the altar, God provided a substitute. Abraham did not withhold his son from God and God made a way at just the right time. Not early, not late, but precisely when he meant to and needed to. All of this pointing to foreshadowing a day that would come that when God's only son would be led up a hill himself and offered <laughs> as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And as God made a way, he made to Abraham another promise. Not a promise that was pie in the sky, but a promise that would be kept and would be secure 
A promise which was not only for Abraham, but was for the generations which would follow, even until the present day and beyond. For as Abraham obeyed God, God promised his blessing. A blessing which would not spoil, nor fade. A blessing which was not dependent on season or feeling or emotion, but rather a blessing and promise which was for all eternity, changing the course of history, changing everything forever. See, from Abraham's line would come the blessing of God for every person, the promised Messiah, the ultimate substitute, the rescuer, God in human form, Jesus Christ, hope of the nations, the one who would crush the serpent's head. And today we live in the fulfillment of that promise and experience the blessing which he brings. His arrival would change everything forever. His arrival and then his consequent death would literally split history in two. His arrival would bring about the kingdom of God to earth and make possible right relationship with God. And as the worship team come now and as we head into a time of communion and as the worship team come and the stewards distribute the elements to us whilst we sing, I ask that we would hold them so that we can eat and drink together. And let us remember that we come before a faithful God who is not slow in keeping his promises. Let us remember that just as Isaac was laid on the altar that day and God provided a way, that we too were destined for death before Jesus. The sacrificial lamb took our place on Calvary's tree. So let us come with thankful hearts for the blood that was shed for our ransom that we might be called children of God. Let us remain seated as the elements are distributed. Thank you.